Many of you know him already from his past work. You have probably even worked with him. But uh, he's actually been doing some interesting work in accessibility space that uh, he wanted to come give a talk on here. He's got good students working on the space as well. So um, I won't say much more other than some of his work got slashed out of last week. So this is, this is real stuff. <laughs> slashed <time>. out. <laughs> Uh, thank you, TV, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to see all you know my former students and former UW students and former colleagues here, like Udi Mamber and Taylor and, and uh, Pablo, Pablo. So today I'm going to talk about making web pages accessible. And this talk is adapted from a, a, a talk that uh, Jeff Bigham gave at the Assets Conference in Portland in the fall. Um, so browsing while well, blind, I guess we have some experts here on that, but uh, most blind people uh, use screen readers uh, if they're really blind or not low vision. Uh, there's like window eyes and jaws are the, are the two most popular. Uh, now these are nice, but they, they can't, uh, they're not good enough to read images yet. Uh, and an image is a very complex thing and, and, and it's much more difficult than text, for example. Now W3C, uh, accessibility standards, they can't require anything, but they can sort of suggest or uh, uh, say something like that, that every image should have some, non, uh, some, some textual equivalent as alternative text. Uh, and that can be done in a number of ways, and I'll talk about that in a moment. If there is no alternative text, what does a screen reader do? Well, it, it may do nothing because that there's nothing, no option uh, for it to do, um, it may return a file name because most images have a file name, and this one here says 060315 underscore B A N N E R banner underscore and some that in, something that ends in GIF. I read that out for TV Raman's sake. Um, would that be satisfactory? Probably not uh, as an alternative text. Or um, maybe better would be a link address if it's a, an active element and it has a, a, a link associated with the image. So this one would be http colon slash slash www.cs.washington.edu. And that might not be as good as something that said, uh, you know, link to University of Washington or something like that, or to the computer science department at the University of Washington. So here's a kind of a beautiful page from a Yale. It's the Yale Alumni Association page, and it looks just wonderful. Uh, that has lots of text, has uh, navigation stuff on the left, and articles about Yaleys or Elis, or whatever they call themselves. Uh, but what, what somebody with a screen reader would sort of see is what I'm going to show next is, well, actually, all that text were images <coughs> on the left. So just about the only thing left are the articles. There's no navigation anymore. So all you'd get, a screen reader would tell you, if you were on the left side there doing the tab key, it would tell you some, a bunch of URLs that hopefully might have some meaning. But the text is gone. There's no alternative text for those images. So wouldn't it be nice to insert those somehow, to automatically do that for uh, somebody using a screen reader? So here's an example of one of those images, nav underscore svcs dot gif which is not very helpful. So I'm going to start with uh, some web studies uh, that we've done. And, and we'll talk about different ways that you could provide labels. And one of the exciting ways to provide labels or alternate text is through something like the, image, the Google Image Labeler, or formerly called, I guess, uh, uh, the ESP game. And then we'll talk a little bit about the Web Insight system and what we've built so far. Uh, I think I can actually give a demo. Uh, of that, uh, a little bit about the evaluation uh, and some future work. And also I'm going to talk just very briefly, one slide each, about some other uh, projects that I'm working on. So our web studies, well, not all images um, are equal. So some images are significant. That is, they're informative. They have information in them. Um, they have a link associated with them. So in this example here, uh, uh, you would hope that they would have some alternative text. So for example, 
uh, a, an image that had as its uh, file name graph.gif. <coughs> an alternative text might be sales graph. That might be a, a decent one. And, or it might be in the title, sales graph, or in this long description, it might have something else. So this actually is something that will be found on, on the web. Now, insignificant images, well, there's lots of those on the web. They're little decorative items, uh, spacing. Some of them, most of them are one color or very few colors. Uh, they're usually quite small. Uh, those, those we call insignificant images. And, and actually, they should have alt text, too, according to the W3C uh, standard. It should be, um, uh, it should just have um, an empty alternative text. Now, believe it or not, there are, are, are some people that actually put in things like spacer, 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 and a blind person would have to listen to that, all those spacers. But it, the screen readers won't read out those empty ones. So uh, we have this uh, automatic determination of significance that we're actually in the process of sort of testing its validity right now. Before we wrote this paper, we did not, but uh, we had a pretty good feeling that worked well. Um, so I have a couple of undergraduates working on this. Um, so for our automatic significance determination, we said if it's, if it's more than one color and both dimensions are greater than 10 pixels, then it's significant. Or it has an associated action, it's clickable or has a link or something like that, then it's uh, significant. So that's just a, 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 um, a non-subjective way of determining significance, and we're testing its validity uh, this spring. So our first web study, um, well, let me talk about previous web studies. And I have to admit that, that everybody does it slightly differently, so it's kind of hard to compare numbers. And so you can see that these numbers are quite different. So in three different, uh, or two different studies, they looked at all images. They didn't determine whether they were significant or not. The, the numbers that they came up with were 27.9% were labeled, or 47.7% were labeled, or 49.4% were labeled. So that was kind of tough. So these studies, some ignore significance, some include significance, um, some ignore uh, image frequency. In fact, I think most of these do. That is, some images actually come up a lot, but they're just counted at once. So the, the, the actual studies are listed below there. And then, and then we, so we went out and we did kind of a sort of a similar study, but we tried to determine which of the significant images actually did not have or had alternative text. And it depended on which group you went to. So we looked at five groups. And here we didn't look at frequencies again. We just look at these groups of web pages. Some, some 500 high traffic web pages from, I think it was from the uh, Nielsen rating. So I'm sure Google was up there uh, near the top. Uh, computer science departments from the CRA list. There was 158 departments in the CRA list. Uh, the top 100 universities in the world. Uh, the 137 US federal agencies and all 51 states. So we looked at these five groups. And, and again, we came up with uh, different numbers uh, for the significant images. And also in this table, we show uh, uh, what percentage of these groups had at least 90% of their images labeled correctly with the significant label, labeled images? The, the total number of images was very large. The high traffic was over, almost 33,000 images. If, if, yes? If a page has no images, is that 0% or 100%? That's 100%. It's 100%. I don't think any of these, I think there might have been one or two computer science departments that that didn't have any images. So, um, so there's a difference between, you can see there's a difference between the sort of sites like high traffic, computer science, and universities. They were 39.6%, 52.5%, and 61.5% respectively. So they were, well, they were kind of numbers similar to those other studies that we showed. And, but if you went to the US federal agencies, 74.8% of those images were labeled. By law, they should all be labeled because there's a section 508 that requires federal agencies to be have their web pages accessible. And of course, that seems to be moving over toward a little bit, not that particular law, but 
the ADA seems to be affecting groups like Target, uh, that the current law or the current interpretation of the law is that um, in a recent case is that the web page is an extension of the, of the company, of the, of the store, and so it's supposed to be accessible, so the web page should be accessible. So um, the National Federation of the Blind representing somebody uh, won a lawsuit against Target because of that. And then if we go to the U.S. states, it's even better. It's 82.5% of those images are, have correct labels. So, and almost all the states have as part of their requirements to follow the same requirements as the federal government. So you can see there's a big difference. So it does seem that these requirements make a difference. But also it shows you that the numbers are pretty small. But these studies are a little unsatisfactory because they don't include frequency. So we did another study, a uh, web traffic study. So we were fortunate at the University of Washington that they've already done a bunch of web traffic studies for other purposes. And so we adopted that technology. Um, we have to be very careful that everything has to be anonymized and we can't really look at the data. We could measure significance, they let us do that, <laughs> and things like that. So we looked at uh, one week of web pages arriving at our department in, at the University of Washington, and there were about 12 million images that were uh, brought to the department. And of that group, 40.8% were significant. And of those, 63.2 had alternative text. So the 63.2, I feel, is at least for an academic institution and probably, I, I would, if Google did the same study, I believe you would come up with a number similar to 63.2. So I think 65% uh, you know, of significant images on the web that are downloaded by intelligent people <laughs> or whatever, uh, have alternative text. So that's actually you know, better than expected. And this number is bigger than those numbers on those previous studies and bigger than most of the numbers on our earlier studies. So this one it really includes frequency. Um, yes? I, I know this is a much harder uh, thing to measure, but is, is there any sort of sense of um, useless alternate text versus useful? Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, there's, two things. One, if something is really truly insignificant, it's just decorative, and it does have alternative taste, text, like I said, space, that space, that's not useful. If you, have a significant if you have a significant image that has alternative text, it might not be appropriate. And my student, Jeff Diggum, did a study of that, and you know, I, I'd say it's preliminary, but it seemed like 95% was appropriate. So it's a large fraction. So the other question to ask, how much is a blind user missing out of the page? So if you take your sales graph example, so that's a significant image. And if you label it as sales graph, I still got way less information than somebody who saw the damn sales graph and knew whether it went up or down. So, so that's where this problem gets very hard to measure with respect to how lossy is that web page, mm -hmm. given that you cannot see the picture. Right. I, I would say sales graph is appropriate, but not fully informational. Right. So that's, you know, there's levels right. of, of this. I don't, I don't know. I, that's, that's a good point, and, and we haven't really looked at that. So let's, what about providing labels? Um, well, we have three ways that we've thought about. One is context labeling. If, if we know something about the image nearby, or the image is clickable, and we can go to another page. The title of that page is probably good alternative text. So important images, certainly any image with link is important, and it's often often described by, uh, by the title of the page. So that's one way to do it. So we call that context labeling. So here's an example of an image, and it has, uh, excuse me, four images on a page, and if you just follow the links, you get good titles. So in this case, uh, a good title for one of these images is People of UW. That turned out to be the title of the page that this image went to, and it did not have alternative text. And so you can insert that as alternative text in a, in a, transform, in a, uh, like a transformation proxy. Another one we've used is OCR labeling. And uh, 
you know, we spent a little bit of time on this. I'm sure there's better ways to do it. So in this picture here, we have a button that says register now, exclamation point. And the button is very stylistic. It, it's, it has multiple colors and, you know, black, white, and red. So we did a basic color segmentation and, and formed like six images from it of the different colors. And we pass each through the OCR, each of these images. And, and it turns out that one of these colors is good. It's white. And so the white image um, gets uh, uh, turned into black, and then the OCR can understand it, and we get something. So we'll go through all this text produced, and in many cases, no text is produced, but sometimes garbage is produced, like in one of these. And then register now is produced, and we can look it up in a dictionary and then say, okay, that looks like it might be a good alternative text. So there are very important buttons. Uh, register now maybe might be important because right next to it is cancel, you know, <laughs> or something like that. So uh, this kind of, uh, uh, and we'll talk about some studies we did on this, on this methodology, OCR labeling, optical character recognition. Okay, so I sort of went through this. Oh, here's the result, actually. Let me just finish the slide. And the, so we were able to improve recognition of a set of like 100 buttons by 25%. Yes. Who was asking the question? Yeah. Yeah, so, so I guess my question was, you know, what if there is some buttons that have multicolored text, like say the logo of some company? Yeah, well, so we did this, this <laughs> yeah, so we, I oversimplified this. We do color clustering, yeah. and with the color clustering, we try to reduce it. We don't look at all the colors, but we'll just do some quantization to, to get a smaller number of colors, maybe 20 colors or 15 colors, and then do this technique. And that seemed to work fairly well. So what's your intuition for why that works better than just bringing your black and white here? Um, well, this one here is sort of black and white here. And it didn't, it did, the OCR didn't work. So we're using like high quality OCR as well. Now there were, I forgot how many in our study, you know, maybe half the buttons did go through OCR and give you reasonable text without any any change, without doing this color segmentation. The Google logo would be a problem. I don't know if we did that one, but I think Google is very good. They always have alternative text, so yeah. We don't. The reason I'm suggesting it is that if you can do this for Flash, that might be useful for you, not just for Flash. That's true. So I blocked Flash. For a search. Uh, no, I, I blocked Flash. And I recently moved to a browser that I couldn't block Flash. And after about half an hour, I couldn't use the browser. I didn't realize how much I'm not missing. <laughs> so if you can take the Flash and just take the OCR or do anything else, study, you know, for example, the university webpage we looked at more carefully. No, excuse me, the department webpages we looked at more carefully because I gave a report to CRA about their, about that. And there were only, of that 158, there were only uh, a few, maybe two or three that used Flash. Well, I'm doing that same study again. I did that in June last year. I'm doing it again and find out how many more have Flash. So it is growing. And you're right. It, it, you know, probably a year ago it didn't matter, but it's mattering more. So I think, yeah, I think it's a great idea. If I remember correctly, although we have come up with this term, we need to make the pressure of this. So yes, they have. If you choose, then other screen readers can access the information better than the red. That's, again, that's if the developer puts in the text. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So the developer has to take care to do that. Otherwise, it will not work. Yeah. And most of this, the screen readers they cannot what? I mean, there are, there are some screen readers that can take advantage of the embedded text in flash, but there are other screen readers which cannot. So, yeah, it's true. I mean, it will be So, I'll just repeat your comment that the, the flash has done some accessibility, ways to provide accessibility by providing text, and right. some screen readers can take advantage of that. Right, but others can, yeah. What about JAWS? Do you know about JAWS? JAWS can. JAWS can. 
So this is where Google comes in. It's the, it's the human labeling. And uh, I put up there the, the, the logo for Google Image Labeler. I don't know if that beta is still there. Is that still a beta? Uh, beta. It still has a beta on there, which is uh, the, uh, the grandchild, I guess, of the ESP game from uh, Louis Von Ahn. And Fetch is another uh, labeling game, but it needs more data than just the image to get it uh, seated. And these are sort of take the, uh, the idea that, well, humans are best at labeling if we can do it. Um, these recent games, you know, they, they tend to compel accurate labeling, although at our meeting just a few minutes ago with the image labeler people, they told me that there is a lot of, you know, I wouldn't call it spamming, but uh, tricking the game so that, that if you kind of agree that a good word is, you know, man for every single image and, and half the people that play the game agree that, then they start getting more points, but all they're getting is points, you know, so it's not like money. Um, but I think most labels are fairly accurate. When I played the game and see what, for example, the taboo words are, the taboo words are always pretty good words for the, for the image. In fact, it's kind of hard to come up with a new word after you see the taboo words. Uh, I'll show you a, a, a screenshot of the, of, the, of the game in a moment. Uh, so this web insight, we have uh, 10,000 images that we stole from, from the ESP game because we did have cooperation with Louis Van Aan for that, and, and we used that. Um, but this is a very tiny subset of, of what people would actually use. And the interesting thing is that you could do this on demand, that if a blind person was at a page and an image was not labeled, we could send that, we could send that image to the image labeler and it would get a label pretty quickly and you know what I mean by the end of that session on that page it might have a, a label on it. I brought that up today and rolled some eyes <laughs> in my group. Oh here's a picture of the image labeler. If you haven't played I, I think everybody at Google probably has played by now but uh, this I did pretty well on this one. I had a pretty good partner. I got 800 is like that's as much as I can get in this in this game. But it just it, it shows you uh, that there's an image there, there's a place to put in some text. There's some things that are off limits, I guess, taboo words. And there's labels I did. I, I took the screen, I only had eight seconds left in this game, so I took the screenshot before I typed anything in. But you can see some previous things that we agreed on. There was a image that we both agreed on, a, that it's a planet, an airplane. It looks like an airplane wreck, actually. Um, a bug and a mountain. And I think all of those are pretty good labels. You know, they're not like telling you everything, what kind of bug that is. Actually, one of the things I put in there was wasp, because it looked like a wasp. But, and then there's some more at the bottom of the page. And one of these here, I just put in the word text, and that was, we agreed. And I put in here handwriting, and we agreed, you know. So um, I can't remember what these other ones were, but we got these eight correct. And that one we got correct, too, and I actually got 900 points in this game, because I did type in something. I think pretty quickly after taking that screenshot. Screenshot only takes a, a moment to do. Um, so let me talk briefly about this uh, web insight. Before I do, uh, uh, we've discovered that, that, that we're not the, the inventors of this idea. It's been around for a while. There's something called the Altifier. Have you ever heard of that uh, um, TV, Raman? No. Yeah, so it came out of University of Toronto. It was a, from a W3C initiative, and it started in 1998 and finished in 1999, and, and, and the web page is dated 1999, so it's like dead. And it had this concept of a registry of alternative text, so it'd be a database with alternative text in it. And you can imagine that database being seeded in many different ways, like with OCR, with human labeling, with you know, this context labeling we talked about. They, the only way they seeded it was with the, with the context type labeling. And then it automatically suggests alternative text for, for images via a proxy. So our system, uh, it's going to, you know, it's, it, it's, there's different ways you can engineer it, and I'll describe some of those in a moment. But it's going to coordinate multiple labeling sources. It's going to insert alternative text into web pages via a proxy or via uh, an extension like a Firefox extension. Uh, it'll add code to insert the alternative text later if need be. So some of the features are the browsing speed is preserved. We're trying to make, it's not going to ruin the browsing experience. Um, the alternative text available will be, uh, when, uh, uh, 
be available when it's formulated, so it's immediate. And, um, and then it'll be stored in the database, so the next time you just look it up. And the database is indexed by MD5 of the image itself. So if it's a compressed image, whatever the file is, just MD5 it, and you got a name for it, and that's the, in, the index. So if two images are slightly different, they, they, they were compressed on different JPEG compressors or something like that, then they would be different in the database, but that's probably okay. So this is our, our initial design. So we have uh, our blind user uh, using a browser. Uh, that blind user makes a web request. It goes out to a proxy. The proxy then sends it off on into the, back into the internet and retrieves it from wherever it's coming from. And then analyzes it for any images that it has on it. And then looks up at its database uh, what images it should insert and puts those into, inserts those into the web page, transforms that web page to something that has alternate, alternative text for, for the images. And that is returned to the blind user. And you want this to be fast. And I actually can give a demo of, uh, well, I'm not, I, I don't think I can give a demo of this. I'll give a demo of some, something similar a little bit later. So that's one organization. So I, there's a big box around the the, the context labeling, the OCR labeling, the human labeling, all those would be on perhaps on this, you know, uh, they might be in separate places, but they all be controlled by the same organization and the database by another organization. So you could imagine Google owning that whole piece in the middle, for example, and you could call that, uh, you could call that thing, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, Google image proxy or something like that. So that's one possible thing. So another organization that uh, we built is something like this. We have a Firefox extension that's local. And so all the context lo labeling doesn't really need a database. You can just do that on the fly. And uh, so that's done through the extension. So there's no database local. So those things are not even fed into the database. Uh, the request doesn't go through a proxy at all. But the extension contacts this, when it does have an image, that it can, doesn't, for example, have context labeling for, then it will contact some server, some labeling service, uh, which could have OCR on it, could have a human labeling, has a database, and, and just gets those, uses the MD5s and gets those uh, alternative texts. And also the extension could make requests to get things done, like to get something OCR to put on the database or to get something human labeled going out to some other service like Google, Google Labeler. So these are two alternatives, and we built both of these, both of these two. Except for the human labeler part, we don't have a human, well, we do have a primitive human labeler that we built that is, that you have to trust the person to do the labeling. It's not from the image labeler. So here's some basic issues. The distribution of tasks, there's this database, who takes care of that? Uh, there's the OCR, how is that done? Is that done in a separate site? The human labeling, where is that done? So it's just sort of the distribution of all these labeling services. Authorization, who should be allowed to even use this system? Because you can imagine, for example, that somebody's developed a very large database of labels for images. Well, you don't want to make that accessible to the world. You want to have some limited access to it. Uh, because they could copy that, for example, and use it to improve search, uh, which might not be a good idea. Uh, privacy concerns. Uh, copyright concerns, and accuracy. Are these labels that are being provided actually accurate? So a little bit about evaluation. So measuring the system performance, uh, we tested on the web pages from the site study. So um, the, the study of all those web pages that we did, not, not the pages that were coming to the, the uh, what I call the um, yeah. Well, I had the two studies, the one with the sites and the one with the UW, uh, all the web pages coming to UW. We didn't do that one because we didn't have permission to do that. So we used just context and OCR labeling because we didn't have any human labeling power. And we labeled with just that 43.2% of unlabeled significant images. And uh, this is where we're evaluating it. And we haven't done that, that these are good labels. But our preliminary studies, or 
Um, so actually, we did sample 2,500 of these, and 94.1% were correct. But we have a bigger study. Did, did you have a chance to look at the ones that weren't correct and see what, if there were any systematic uh, kinds of failures? You know, Jeff knows that, and I don't. So I don't think there probably are some systematic ones, but I don't know what they are. So this does seem to be pretty good. You know, we got 43.2%. That does seem to be a benefit. But there's still about half of those significant images still aren't labeled. So the conclusion is that uh, lack of alternative text is pervasive. Maybe 40% of images that should have labels don't. Um, WebInsight calculates alternative text, so it does that. The WebInsight inserts alternative text automatically. And um, it has pretty good accuracy. So here's some future work. Um, we're in the process. We, we, we're in the process of building a user study, a user observation study, to figure out what blind users actually do on their screen readers, and we have a pool of blind people that are willing to help us uh, with that. Um, I have to admit that they're all really, really sharp. They're at least college students and above, so it, it might not be a balanced or unbiased set of blind users, but they're high power. I call them high power blind users. Um, and we're going to test you know, the interventions. We're going to find out what they do, what kind of tasks they want to do, and see if this image labeling actually helps them finish their tasks more quickly. Um, we're also interested in the content producers. And this sort of uh, built this sort of new direction for this research. Um, so we're going to do some user studies on, on web developers to find out what they're doing about accessibility and how they insert alternative text. And, how difficult or how easy that is, and what processes they currently use. And then uh, uh, we're going to we develop, or we're in the process of developing uh, this Web Insight developer. And we're just finishing a paper now for the, w, uh, the W4A conference, which is uh, this summer. It's a big web accessibility conference in BAMP. Um, so, you know, if you think about these labels, they, they weren't, they were, you know, we didn't get a lot of them without the human labeling. Uh, we got that 43% or something like that. So there's a lot of empty space there that somebody should put some labels in. And maybe web developers could do it. Well, if we made it really easy to put it in there, like we made the suggestions, and half the suggestions were actually good suggestions, they wouldn't have to type anything. They'd just say yes or no. Yeah, that's good. So that 43% of labels would be done. And they would just have to do the rest. And if we had the human labeling in, it might even be better. So it's just like, can we use the very same idea to aid web developers to putting alternative text into their programs? And that's the thing I can demonstrate in, in, in a few minutes. So just the, the fact that you know, human labeling by the uh, Google image labeler is not going to give you the greatest labels necessarily, but there might be good suggestions and help that web developer uh, put something in that's better. So this is actually a screenshot, but I can give you a, a, a demo later. So this screenshot shows the home page of the Department of Computer Science. <coughs> At the very top is a banner. And in there is something a web developer could, could use. And it would just go through the images. And right now, it's on this image at the bottom of the page that has CRA in it. And, um, and then so it knows where its context is. And then uh, it. It gives the suggestions. Well, the original text was uh, Computing Research Association, which it deemed as good. Uh, the link went to a page which titled Computing Research Association parentheses CRA, which seems good as well. Maybe that's even better. And OCR didn't do anything. We weren't able to get anything out of OCR. Um, and so maybe we'll use Computing Research Association as kind of the, the intersection or a good balance between the things that came out. And that would be the suggestion. So actually, in this case, there is some alternative text, and you're satisfied with it. So you just go on to the next one. But generally, unfortunately, the University of Washington Department of Computer Science has good labels. So we'd have to go to another page, and maybe we'll do that in, in uh, try another page that doesn't have one. So there's more challenges uh, here uh, that we're considering working on. 
fact, we've written an NSF proposal to work on these additional problems besides images. There's also the content structure, and I saw some beautiful stuff today uh, that TV Rama was from where, where he's able to sort of uh, parse a web page and, and sort of get down to the nitty gritty of what the text is on the page and organize it in a pretty good way. Uh, so trying to do this for pretty complicated web pages. I don't know if that works all the time, TV, but it worked well in, in the stuff you showed. Yeah. Um, there's dynamic content. Uh, a blind person does not use the mouse. You know, they use a tab key from, to go from, uh, say, link to link or field to field or whatever. Uh, so in a, in a form, a web form. But if something requires a mouse over, then goodness, what do you do? So we're trying to figure out ways to handle that as well. Uh, and a proxy could do that. It could do a sort of a virtual mouse over of everything to see what's on the page that, that's dynamic and analyze it. Is it really needed to be dynamic? If it's not needed to be dynamic, then it can make it not dynamic and deliver something that is not as dynamic as the original page, but has the same content. Um, and then web applications, uh, web applications because of Google and other companies are growing. I'm word processing, email, texting, spreadsheets, you know, it's just about everything that we have in Microsoft Office will be a service. Um, and I think for sort of the general masses, it might be the preferred service. It probably wouldn't be a preferred service for a, a company, for example, like IBM. But uh, so making sure these web applications are accessible, not just uh, web pages. So that's sort of work that we're going to do in the future. So what can Google do? I don't know. I probably should have written a new list after our meeting today. But <laughs> um, provide access to image label or database for experimental purposes. I actually suggested that today. And I did get some pushback on that idea. Uh, I, I think it's actually a pretty good idea. Because we don't know how good those labels are for blind people. And, and we could do a, a study at the University of Washington to do that. Now, we wouldn't have to have access to the entire database, but maybe just a selected subset of it that you're willing to, to give up on. And also, we could suggest things to be labeled by the image labeler and to make it a more realistic set for blind people to use. So I think it would be a nice collaborative project. Um, I think there's probably some belief among some people that those labels aren't good labels, but they are good labels. Why are you collecting them? You want to do better search. So they, they, they're probably good for other things as well. And this might be a very good use for them. Generally, just develop some collaborative projects. Uh, uh, I mentioned this today, Google for screen readers, like Google Mobile. So that might be something. Um, and just uh, basically help fund accessibility project at UW that makes sense to, to, to do. But I think we're doing good work. We have smart people. Uh, there's going to be some future hires. And accessibility of the web is a huge topic. It's, it's not just a good thing. It's, in some cases, it's becoming kind of the law. And so uh, if you want to sell anything to the government, suppose some of these beautiful web applications are supposed to be, oh, maybe the, the US government should use a web application. And you have a way to make it nice and secure for them or whatever. Well, they're not going to touch it unless it's 508 compatible. So I thought I'd mention a couple more projects real quickly that I'm working on. And this one's actually fairly mature. It's the tactile graphics uh, project. So I thought I'd give it a little example. So this uh, little picture in the left here is, a, is an image from a pre-calculus book. And um, this particular book has uh, about 1,100 images in it. And the problem is making this whole textbook accessible to blind students who want to advance and become TV Ramans or want to get a degree in chemistry or whatever it is. They're going to have to take pre-calculus. I thought somebody in the room was asking me. But still, I heard about this room. It's, it's, it's the non-room room, I guess. <laughs> um, so how can we do this fast? Right now, it's done by hand, basically. And so to do this entire book would take months. And we'd like to do this in a few weeks rather than months. And so that's the technology we developed. So let me describe it a little bit by sort of an animation. So we have our original image, which has so it's a graph. Uh, it looks like it's uh, some, um, there's a line x equals 15 and then a, a line, I can't read it, uh, uh, x plus y equals 20. 
and then you're looking at the region. So this is a linear programming problem. So you're looking at the region that bounds the two axes and these lines. And that's some kind of like solution space or something like that. And this is in a pre-calculus book. They talked about linear programming in a pre-calculus book. They didn't in my pre-calculus book many years ago. So your pre-calculus book probably didn't have 1,100 pictures either. Because pictures were a lot harder to explain, more expensive to print. Them. Somehow this thing didn't come out. I don't see everything here, but there actually is supposed to be a clean image right next to that. Uh, Dirty, the original scanned image was dirty. We had to clean it up. And then we extract all that text using OCR. Actually, not directly OCR. We extract the text using our own machine learning technology. And then we take that text. And notice that x plus y equals 20 was rotated. So we ro rotate the text so it's all horizontal. And then we put it through OCR. And then we can put it through a Braille translation program. And then we have the Braille. And we take the peer graph. And of course, we know where everything is in that XML file at the top. And then we merge those three in Adobe Illustrator. And out comes a tactile graphic, which you can print on a, uh, on a embosser. Pardon? Oh, it's still outside. Uh, OK. Uh, so I should say that this particular book, we did this 1,100 images in, in person time, one person. It took them uh, 10 minutes per figure. So this is like remarkable. And in, in April this year, we're going to do a training workshop for a bunch of people that do this kind of work in, in Colorado. And hopefully, this, they can learn this workflow. Yes? Uh, which part of this process is the most manual? Uh, actually, every step is, has some manual. Uh, because OCR is not perfect, you have to do corrections. Uh, Going and extracting the text is not exactly perfect, but it's like 99%. So you have a little work to do there. Uh, uh, the conversion from the OCR to Braille is not perfect. Uh, so you need a Braille specialist. That's the only place you really need a Braille specialist. And then going from the, uh, the final layout also needs work. In fact, that's the most time consuming part is when you lay it out. Uh, you might have to move the text around a little bit so that it fits in the right place. Nothing overlaps the image and stuff like that. And that's, uh, we've done quite a bit of work on that already. For example, the text on the, on the uh, y-axis should be right justified and not less justified. So we determine that and we right justify it in the, in the image. Because the Braille will be a different size than the original text. There's also the question I mentioned here. There's, if you look up in the XML, there's some scale factors. So you want to scale it to be bigger so the Braille will fit. And if this, this is, image is only about this big, you have to make it about this big to be readable. OK, and so the other project that's kind of exciting is uh, so this is the, the slash dotted project uh, that TV was mentioning earlier, this mobile ASL project. So um, we're trying to enable uh, American Sign Language communication using video phone, using video cell phones in the, in the current US network, which is the low bandwidth network. And actually, the low bandwidth is not as much of a problem as the low power of the cell phone. They don't have very good processors on them. Uh, so there's limited, bandwidth, limited uh, network bandwidth and limited processing power on the cell phones are the two main limitations. And if anybody wants to talk about this afterwards, I'd be happy to tell you more about this this project. So this is kind of uh, in its first year. And uh, we've done quite a bit on the data compression part, but not on some of the other parts. So I can describe that in full if anybody's interested. So um, that's the end of my talk. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So yeah, Pablo. Um, I, when uh, when Luis Fanon was was here a uh, year or two ago, I, uh, we, we noticed something interesting about the um, about the ESP game, which was that rather than just showing showing the image in, showing the image in its context, would often be much more useful than just showing the image. So, for example, you could um, just showing an image out of context was like, you know, like you know, man, woman, law. And uh, but in context, in the article that appeared in the person, you know, people in the ESP game could say, "Ah, Monica Lewinsky," 
you know, or whatever. And then uh, I'm wonder. I'm trying to figure out if there's any way of doing this, uh, you know, for more general. You know, that that works in a news context. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, is is there is, is there a way to uh, to bring? I guess I should be asking Google Image label <laughs> folks this, but is, is there a way to bring in uh, the well, context the, of the image when looking? Well, the all, I know the one. I think, no, they only show at the, at the end of the game. They do show you the, the name of the image, you know, the uh, file name. Yeah, that's the only thing. I but not during the game. No, but, but, but more importantly, the surrounding context of the web page where that image showed up. Mm -hmm. I think it's far more important than the other things. Yeah. yeah. Well, it sounds like you should talk to the image labeler people yeah. to, to have them add that context. It seems like you could have the game in, in a way where you don't have the context first and you run out of ideas and you can push a button and then some more stuff comes up about it. But remember, you only have a minute and a, and a half. Right. You probably pass before you do that. And I think like the bug, you know, that might be, you know, if, if you see that um, uh, in the context, it, 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 this could be a page about um, Drosophila melanogaster, uh, fossil found wherever, and you say, ah, okay, you know, and that's by, by looking at the web page it's on, you can say, ah, you know, I can tell you more than that. This is a bug. I can tell you this is a fossil. It's amber. It's etc. You could also have, you know, you could have a, a game for entomologists. You know, exactly. I'm an entomologist, and somebody else is an entomologist, and then you know, yeah. So you have specialists. Specialists, yeah. Find all the bugs in the cage. Find all. Of them. <laughs> I can't spend a lot of time doing that. <laughs> any any other? It's actually more like a comment than a question. Um, so, how would you handle? Sorry. <laughs> how would you handle images um, that's been sprited? Like you, know, you could be using the same image GIF file, but spriting it, you know, dividing it to use as icons, you know, multiple icons. So, since you mentioned, you know, you would use MD5 to associate one word with the image. Now you have like multiple images. I, I, we don't have a lot, but that's a, it is, does happen a lot. This is a relatively new technique, but it has gotten very popular in yeah. the last nine months. Because it speeds things up significantly. I guess you know, it makes more relevance since you mentioned Firefox extension, which is a cool idea, by the way. Well, one thing I do know is that a lot of these images are clickable, and these different areas of the images will have different URLs. And so I think doing context labeling for those would not be too difficult, because that's why they're, that's why they're sprited. Well, no, the, problem, the problem with spriting is that there's only one URL in the image. Um, so the, 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 the there's CS, only one URL for the whole image? Yeah, there's basically what it is is imagine like you have 10 16 by 16 images you want to show on a page. You basically build up one big div file um, and then you use CSS to basically set up a little portion of the page that you know is a portfall into a portion of the image. So there is only one URL address for the whole 10 by 10, you know, that whole 10 by 10. Uh, I'm thinking of the URL for the if it's an active image. Yes, yes those it, URLs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. If it's an anchor, yes. Okay. That's what I was speaking. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question about your tactile graphs and have you had any luck? You're depending on just a scan. Have you done any work with tactile graph destruction where you had access to the source? as of a tech document or an SVG, and would that offer any benefit? Um, if, if the image were SGV, SVG, it's a vector graphic. Vector graphic. Then this, this whole technology is needed in some sense, because all that information is there. And so it's parsing that SVG to pull out the, you know, to do the right thing. So, uh, so we're not even worried about that. But the current standard for doing tactile graphics is the process I described. You scan the image. You can first you get copyright permission to even do that. You scan the image, and and then you by hand, either with some, some computer assistance, transform it into an image that's going to be useful for a blind person. So it's um, that's sort of the way it's done now. I should mention one other thing that. 
one database we did have that we didn't start with was was a bunch of EPSs. And for that one, we said, well, why don't we go? And, and there are text extractors for for EPS already out there, public domain stuff. So we, we put our text extractor into all these images, and we got almost nothing. And we found out later that the the companies that own these EPSs, you know, people that are published, they, they have their own proprietary fonts, and they just have bitmaps for those. And so that's what's inside the, these EPSs. So text isn't even in there. Well, you actually either get no text or you get some bizarre text string, which is all the core points that they use. Mm -hmm. from the, uh, I remember converting uh, PDF documents to Adobe and seeing BBC on the top corner of any pages, and then it turned out to be the Adobe logo, the second special font. <laughs> There's three core points. <laughs>